City of Zion welcomes you to our Sunday church service. Let's join Intensity for worship moments. What?
worthy, oh God, of all the praise and all the honor. So today we just want to worship you, oh God. Saying there's no one worthy, there's no one holy, there's no one higher than you, oh God. We just want to worship you. We just want to worship you, oh God. Hallelujah. Ungofanelwe. Ungofanelwe. Uwe uwe. Ungofanelwe. 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 Uwe uwe. Go find a way.
We shall see victory, O oh God, because you are the one who gives us the victory, O oh God. For if you are for us, O oh God, who can be against us, O oh God? We thank you for the blood that speaks even now. We are victorious because of the blood, O oh God. Thank you. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the
Welcome again to another Sunday morning at the City of Zion. If you are watching this as it premieres live on YouTube, it means you are not with us live in this auditorium. Yes, we are back. We are live right here, right now at 93 Graystein Drive at the City of Zion. And it is popping. I know it is popping. I know the glory of God is moving because even though this is a pre-recorded service for your benefit, God always shows up at the city of Zion. If you're out of town, you are out of country, you're, you're battling with some comorbidities, the Lord heals you, or maybe you are physically unwell, then we're cool. I understand why you're not in here with us. But if none of these applies and you were just lying down on that bed listening, no, 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 it's time to come back to church. The details, registration details are on the screen. We are ready for you. There is just something different about a live recording. You you cannot afford to miss out on what God is doing. And so the details for you, your spouse, your friends, your enemies, your frenemies, the details also for your kids are on the screen. It is also going to be put on the description for this particular recording. It's also going to be on the live chat. You have no excuse. I'm looking forward to catching you on Sunday, next week Sunday, the 14th of March. It is good to be back live in service, but don't worry about it. If for some major reason you have to be at home, we will still bring you quality programming, quality service, even online. Are you ready? A few things that I just want to get off my chest, okay? We have been on a series titled Go G. This is for me extremely pivotal because like you've heard me say over the past few weeks, right? It was the last statement or set of last statement that Jesus made to us before he resurrected. I think that that makes it a very important one for us to consider. It was also one of the first statement that Jesus said to the emerging church, to the church that he had just given birth to. And so our understanding of what Jesus meant when he said all power has been given unto him is so crucial. It's so critical. And for the past, what, three, four weeks, we have been breaking it down. Have you missed any part? If you've missed any part, your understanding will be lopsided. I kid you not. Because we have been building line upon line, precept upon precept, and we are going to continue. Do you know, since the series started, I have won personally. I'm not talking about those that we've won to Christ as a result of our scheduling. I'm not talking about those that we've won to Christ because of the TBN show or because of even our live broadcast that you are watching now. No, I'm talking about people that I have personally won to Christ. Since the series started, I personally won to Christ three people. There is a Maxwell, there is a Tatenda, there is a Tawanda, and we're trying to see how we can establish this individual. Saints of God, what is your record? Do you even have a record? To just listen to the word and not act on it 
is a very, very dangerous game. I kid you not, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to make you feel scared or anything, but it is, according to scripture, a very dangerous game. James 1 verses 22 to 25, listen to this, listen to this. It says, but don't just listen to the word. What translation is this? I think this is the New Living Translation. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Did you notice? It didn't say you, you could, it's better off. It will be nice. It will be preferred. It says you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourself. Don't hate the messenger. It's written there in the word. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. Verse 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your mirror at your face in the mirror you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like he is saying it is extremely ridiculous come on i mean how do you look at yourself in the mirror and immediately forget what you look like he's saying that, that whole process of hearing the word of god and not responding and not obeying it is as ridiculous ridiculous as seeing your face in the mirror and forgetting what you look like. He's also saying you clearly did not hear it. Why? Because proof that you heard is not in the fact that you took notes. Anybody can take notes. The devil takes notes. He takes notes so that he can know what to use to counter the believer. The devil took notes when God was speaking to Adam and Eve and telling them what they should and should not do. So the devil takes notes. It's not no big deal that your notes are rather comprehensive. It's no big deal uh, that when you post your notes on, on, on social media, we marvel because it's clear that you listen. Proof that you heard is not in your note taking. Proof that you heard is not that you are sitting in front of the television or whatever device you're using. Proof that you heard is not that you are even in the live service. Proof that you heard is that you obeyed, is that you responded to it. Let's continue. Verse 25 then says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, that's the word of God, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, uh, then God will bless you for doing it. The, the blessing is in the doing. When you hear, uh, that's great, but the blessing is when you act on what you've heard. Uh, to not be bothered by the lost. Listen, when I say the lost, I'm referring to individuals that have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior. I remember the person I led to Christ yesterday when I was asking him whether he he had received Christ. He was saying, yes, you know, I, I, everything I do, I commit to God. I said, it's not the same thing. We are all creations of God, but we are not all children of God. Some people want to say we're all God's children. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's not in the Bible. We are all God's creation, but to be God's child, you must accept Jesus as your Lord and your savior. So to not be bothered by the lost is to not care about what God cares about. Uh, but we are consistently screaming that God must care about what we care about. Uh, you could argue and say, yes, yes, uh, but God's love is unconditional. I agree with you. But for you to use that as your counter, your counter to say, yes, God must care about what I care about, even though I don't give a flying fig about what he cares about because his love is unconditional, is extremely sad. It's extremely sad. You have just joined the gang of those who abuse his love. That's a sad and wicked place to be. Don't throw stones yet. If you're going to throw stones at me based on what you're about to hear, hold on. It's going to get worse. I'll give you even more reasons in a few moments. <laughs> a person who shows you love, even when you are at your worst, deserves the best of you and not the worst of you. Uh, let's look at this verse again in the message translation. That is the same James, right? What was it? That was James chapter 3, chapter 1. Look at what it says in the message uh, translation. It takes no prisoners because uh, this issue is an urgent matter. Verse 22 says, Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. 
Act on what you hear. Put an exclamation mark. It's a serious issue. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. You will say, but that's impossible. That's ridiculous. Yes, but that's what many of us are doing. But whoever catches a glimpse, verse 25, but whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it is no distracted scatterbrain but a man or woman of action that person will find delight and affirmation in the action i gotta read it again he says but whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of god the free life even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it is no distracted scatterbrain but a man or woman of action. It is time you and I are men and women of action. Anybody can talk. You know how they say talk is cheap? In the kingdom of God, talk is not cheap. Talk is powerful. But when talk is backed up with action, the Bible says faith without works is dead. When talk is backed up with action, there is power. There is power. You see, uh, let me finish this first before I go there. It says, um, is, is, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. There is a delight and an affirmation in that action when we get people saved. Saints of God, time is a bit of an issue for me. I have major time constraints. And, and so anybody who makes the mistake, in their case, the fortune of meandering into my space, uh, that person will be engaged by the word. I remember I was saying to somebody recently, I said, I said, um, when, when you go to a bar, uh, they offer you drinks, right? Um, 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 when you go to school, uh, the teacher will offer you a, a, a notebook or a textbook and teach you. I said, but you happen to stumble into a church and you happen to have stumbled to a pastor. Permit me to give you what I can give you. And that was how we got that particular individual born again. Saints, you don't, there is no time for anything. You make the time. The issue is not whether you have the time. There are people that come around us every day. There are people that we bump into every day. The question is, will we, will we preach the gospel? As you can see, I've already started, and so I'm not going to ask you to stand. But let's read our core verse or sets of verses that all of this is hinged on. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 19. Remain seated, it's okay. If you're in the auditorium, of course, you'll be standing right now, but remain seated just for today. If you have your Bibles, take it, lift it to the heavens, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. <laughs> I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, as I hear his word, it takes root downwards in my heart and it bears fruit a hundredfold upward in my life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 to 19. We've been reading this for the past four weeks, this, this being the fourth week, if my maths is correct. Let's shoot. Matthew 18. Uh, Matthew 18, no, not 18 to 19, is, is verse, Matthew 28, sorry, Matthew 28, 18 to 19. Let's go there, let's go there. Matthew, Matthew, I've just bumped into Mark. Mark, we don't need you at the moment. Let's see. Matthew 18, there we go, 18 to 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Somebody say all power. If you're watching online, I want you to send an SMS to your neighbor. Uh, give somebody a fist bump, a shoulder, uh, a shoulder nudge, an elbow bump, and say all power. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Yo, our assignment is to go everywhere. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let me throw in verse 20. Why not? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you 
all way, even unto the end of the world. Jesus is saying, I receive the power and I have given you the power so that you can bring change. I remember I was I was praying somewhere and a young man came to do some work there um, for the where, where I was and I walked up to him and I said, can I have a word with you? And he said, sure, why not? And I said, I want to talk to you about a man called Jesus. He came and I just went straight. If you don't know how to preach the gospel, you need again to watch part 2, 2A and 2B. I think in part 2A and 2B, I explained. I, I almost gave you word for word so that you can't give the excuse anymore and say, but I don't know what to say. If you don't know what to say, just memorize what I taught you two weeks ago. It will work. And so I went straight for the juggler. And by the time I was done, he was ready to receive Christ. And then he reached out his hand and he gave me his left hand. And I said, I would rather hold your right hand. This was before for Corona, as you can imagine. I said, let me hold your right hand. And he says to me, uh, umfundis, uh, uh, no, you see? Then he shows me his right hand. He was wearing some charms. These are not charms, these are just bracelets. He was wearing some charms on his right hand. And this way, his words, you have no idea what's going on out there. And he showed me and he said, um, umfundis, uh, you see, don't hold this hand, you see? I have put something in this hand because I am going to slap somebody he was going to use the word clap I, mean, I think that meant he was going to slap someone and that that person was going to either I can't remember did he say give him money or the person was going to go crazy but something negative he said and so he, he doesn't want to put me in trouble I shouldn't hold this hand I should hold his left hand and I laughed and I said give me your right hand and I held the hand with the with the we will call it juju uh, voodoo with the charms that were there and nothing happened. When, when I asked him to repeat after me, I closed my eyes and he was, he was repeating after me. And then I opened my eyes to look at him. He was staring at me. He was not closing his eyes. He was staring at me. I don't know what he thought was going to happen. But saints of God, Jesus said, I have given you all power, all power. I remember some, some time ago, I got this, this young man born again. And right now he will not be so young anymore. I got him born again and he was being prepared as the, the high priest to take over from his father who was the chief priest of the, not, not of their clan, the chief priest of their village. And so he was the first son and he was being trained to take over from his father. And he had been undergoing that training for years. I remember I led him to the Lord, got him filled with the Holy Ghost and we sent him on his merry way. Guess what? I bump, no, no, no. He comes to see me a few what, maybe a year later? No, less than a year later, some months later. He comes to see me at the office. Oh no, my goodness, he was looking different. He was changed because when I when I met him the first time, he had all sorts of paintings. You know how the Sangomas do? He had all sorts of paintings on his eyes, blah, blah. He had just come to perform some witchcraft somewhere when I bumped into him and I led him to the Lord. He came back and he said that I wouldn't believe what had happened. That when he got back home, he was afraid to go back home. He said the spirits came after him, but he stood his ground. But when he got back home, he wanted, he greeted his mom, that he went to the shrine uh, where his father and all their gods were kept. His father was in the inner room. He said before he could step into the shrine, the outer part, his father shouted from the inner room and said, do not enter. He said, because if you enter, Everything here will stop speaking to me. Everything here will stop working. He said at that moment he realized, I only got born again, I've only known the name of Jesus for how many weeks, and yet my father is saying that all these so supposed gods, all these supposed powers will be completely subdued if I just stepped into the room. Saints, the power we possess is unprecedented, unparalleled, it has no equal, it is God. Jesus said, all power, has been given unto me. We are without excuse. We are without excuse. Last week, uh, we saw uh, that the, our responsibility to bring souls to the kingdom and establish them is not a preference. 
is not a suggestion, it is a command. Some of us have staff who have never heard the gospel from us. Some of us ride in lift clubs with the same people who have never heard the gospel from us. Uh, some of us even have kids, parents, siblings on their way to hell, on their way to hell, but we are doing nothing about it. The Bible says we should not fool ourselves. We need to stop fooling ourselves. That's what the Bible says. I just read it to you. Who should save them? Who should speak to them? God cannot come down a second time and he doesn't have to. Why? He has me. He has you. Come on, family. Let's do it today. Let's get home and call that auntie and lead her to Christ. Uh, finding, finding the sermon to preach is very easy. I have put it I have given you the words to say. No need to try and formulate. No need to say, oh God, oh God. If you have nothing to say, use what you have already been taught. Check on, 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 on this video. We'll try and put a link up. Check on this channel. You will see where we explain this. Send a message to your co-workers. That's if it's permitted in your company. And ask anyone who needs prayer to see you and you will be shocked you will watch them come. And as they come, before you ask them what's wrong, before you ask them what their issues are, ask them if they have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. If they say yes, ask them how. One of the people I led to Christ, I was asking him, so have you accepted Jesus? Are you born again? And he says, yes. I said, how? And he says, you know, I, I, I ask God to bless everything I do. God is in charge of everything. I said, that is not the same as being born again. There are people who could go to church and be in church for 10 donkey years. And really, it is donkey years because you could do that, but it doesn't mean you are born again. I could sleep in a garage, doesn't make me a car. To be born again, I had to say to one of them, to be born again, you need to believe that Jesus came, died on the third day, rose again, and you need to confess it with your mouth with your mouth so when you ask them so are you are you born again and they say yes ask them how if they say anything different from making that confession i've just mentioned to you then they think they have but they have not been what should you do if you don't know what to do i will say it like a broken record watch part 2b it will tell you what to do it's that easy as the message and new living translation says let's stop fooling ourselves today as emphasis we're going to talk about the third way we must go the third way we must go let's refresh refresh remember we said number one we go ye where it's go ye it's from verse 19 jesus says go ye therefore we go ye first and foremost with our words as we preach and teach the gospel. Number two, we go ye with our lifestyles as we show and live the gospel. I noticed last week's sermon was not liked by too many people. Last week's sermon was not shared by too many people. Last week's sermon were people tuned in and quickly, quickly tuned out. Why? Because many believers today don't want to hear you talk about their lifestyle. Uh, God is God is Lord here, uh, but God don't just touch there. He is, and I've said to you over and over again, if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all in your life. It is the reason you are struggling with some of the things that you are struggling and you are saying God doesn't care. Are you sure he doesn't care? Or is it maybe a case of you not obeying what his word has asked you to do. Our lifestyles, don't tune out now. Don't tune out now. Yes, I'm coming for all of us, not just for you. I'm coming for all of us again. Our lifestyles are sometimes the only Bible people get to read. When we say one thing and do another, there's a word for that. It's called a hypocrite, a hypocrite. The sad part is, People don't just see you as a hypocrite. They see me too. They see Pastor Kemi as a hypocrite. They will see all the pastors as hypocrites simply because of you. People say, 
thinks like they are all the same. And because of our lifestyles, some people reinforce their belief not to receive Christ. No, no, we can't be like this, not us. Do you know, listen to what I'm about to say, I want to teach you something very important. Do you know you carry the name of Jesus? The reason why the name works for some and does not work for others is because for some, there is a reverence when they say the name. For some, there is a reverence. Anybody can say the name. People swear with the name. People make exclamations with the name, even believers. It doesn't mean much, except when it is said with reverence. Saints, to have the name release power, you need to understand that it's the name of God all... It is the name of God Almighty. There has to be reverence when you are going to say that name. I taught a message. It's also on this channel. Maybe we'll put a link up. You need to go watch and listen to that message. It's called Signed Jesus. Check it out on this channel. I then did a whole week of devotions following that message saying, pause before you say that name. That was it, pause before you say that name. When the name becomes precious to you and you then realize that you are carrying that name, it will not just affect how and when you say the name, it will also affect what you do as well. When you realize, when that name becomes a, a name that is precious, a name of reverence to you, and you realize that you have been baptized into that name, it will change the way you live your life. It will change the way you desire to live your life. When we understand that that name is our family name and it is God's, God Almighty's name, we will not be as careless, we will not be as frivolous, we will not be as licentious as we have been. Your lifestyle must also preach the gospel. Please, please listen to last week's message. It will bite. Oh, it bit me deep. It will bite but it will lift you up greatly, all right? Details will either be on the live chat or maybe even on the screen. So number one, we go first and foremost with the words that we speak. Number two, we go ye with our lifestyles. Number three, we go ye with our money as we send the gospel. Number four, we go ye with our gifts and talents as we serve the gospel and serve with the gospel. Number five, we go ye with the miraculous power of God as we demonstrate the gospel. Today we zero in on number three. We go ye with our money as we send the gospel. Saints, listen, without financial support, the limitations on the gospel is and will be astronomical. The gospel is free, but the channels to receiving it isn't free. Money has and will always be a sensitive part of our lives, particularly with recent events, even more so now, even more so now. This is clearly because for many believers worldwide, worldwide, Jesus is Lord in every area except for the bedroom and the boardroom. I remember dealing with some business people who were saying, um, um, this, is, this is business now. Don't bring your God into the business. Because for many of us believers, Jesus is Lord in every area except the bedroom and the boardroom. It's almost as though we say, you are my Lord and I need you, but with my zip and my wallet, let me be. I hope you got that. The Bible refers to the system of this world that controls money as mammon. There's a system that controls money. It calls it mammon. This system is so strong and controlling that it is the only expression of hell directly compared to God by Jesus, not even the devil. It is the only expression of hell directly compared to God by Jesus. Don't believe me? Matthew 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. You, you will think Jesus is about to talk about the devil because he's saying two masters. You will think it's God and the devil. Let's go on. 
He said, he says, or else he will hold to the one and he will despise the other. This is it. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, mammon is different from money. Money is just a tool, a medium of exchange. Mammon is the system uh, that controls the flow of money. Watch this. He says, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. For many of us, money determines who we will marry and if we will even stay married and not God. It determines where we live, where we work, who we hang around. It even determines the kind of church we attend and not God. I've seen many leave churches to attend another. Why? Because their financial ch um, status changed. And so they felt, hmm, can't be in this kind of church anymore. Uh, God isn't saying leave, but I, I, I can't be here. It doesn't befit my status. Uh, that is when you are being controlled. For many of us, we will travel kilometers to work daily to receive money, but argue about needing a church next door due to distance and not according to the voice of God and not according to whether it meets your spiritual needs or not. So the question has to be, who is actually in control here? Who is in control? We relocate because of work without even consulting God uh, because the job demands it and the money supports it. And then when we get into trouble, we say, but God, I've been praying, I've been fasting, and we give other reasons, saints of God, until God controls your zip and your wallet. He is yet to be fully in charge of your life. See this verse, Matthew 6, verse 19 to 20. Shoo, yo, yo. This one was quite hectic. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth, doth corrupt. This is, this is the King James Version. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, uh, where neither moth nor rust doth, doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now let's go into the message translation. It says, don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Hey, God wants you prosperous. Listen, let me read that first part again, that bottom part. It says the place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be. It is the place where you will end up being. For many of us, we are sitting now and we're saying we can't come to live services, I'm afraid of corona but tomorrow for many of you you will get into your car and you will go to a restaurant for a business meeting you will jump into that taxi and you will go to work where there are other people but come into the house of god ah no 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 i will catch corona saints what is actually informing your decisions god wants you prosperous he actually does i'm not making it up he actually wants you prosperous you look at 3 John, um, 3 John 2, it's the, only, it's the only chapter there. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. John was about to die and was about to give his final charge to the body of Christ. And of all things that he could say, he says, God wants you to prosper. He says, he wants you to prosper. He wants you to be healthy. It is God's desire. In the Old Covenant, God also said the same. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, in the New Living Translation, it says, Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. He says he gives you power to be successful. King, King James calls it the power to get wealth. The power to get wealth. He wants you wealthy has absolutely no problem with it. The issue is who is your Lord? That is the issue. Tithing, giving 
is a clear indication as to who controls the God, who controls the God in your life. For money is a God, but is it your God? Let me say it again. Tithing, giving is a clear in indication as to who is the God in your life. Because money is a God, but the question is, is it your God? Men kill for money. Men marry for money. Sell their conscience for money. Betray their faith for money. Sell their bodies for money. Even sell nations for money. Why? For money is a God. Question, is it your God? Does it run your life? Or does God? Matthew 6 says, where your treasure is, we just saw that, that's where your heart will be also. One of the things that set Abraham apart from everyone of, of his time was his willingness to give up Isaac. The writer thought God was testing him, uh, but I've explained over and over again that that was not the case. God says he does not test, neither does he tempt any man with evil. I really can't explain that now in my series, also on this channel, titled, Who is God? Part 1 to 5, I explain that. But let me push on. Abraham's actions opened the eternal. This is why God asked Abraham to do this with Isaac. His actions opened the eternal door to the release of Jesus. See, Abraham represented God on earth by covenant. That's why Sodom couldn't be destroyed until they had a conversation with Abraham and Abraham said so. Abraham didn't know that he could have saved Sodom, but he could have because he represented God's authority on the earth. The Bible says the heaven is the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. When Abraham agreed to release Isaac, the son of promise, in eternity, man, man had opened the door for God to release his own son of promise, Jesus. That was why God asked for Isaac. God was not interested in human sacrifices. Many do not realize the power of giving, the power of tithing, of sowing, of planting a seed. That is a monetary seed, a financial, a seed in time, a seed in your talent, a seed of holiness. Look, all these things are seed. Holiness is a seed. Your time when you invest it in the kingdom is a seed. When you invest your talent is a seed. But many don't understand. Money is a seed. Don't understand how seeds work. Because, because as long as it's not a bean seed or a mango seed that you are planting in the ground, we don't understand that the whole universe runs on seeds. I told you last week that the universe runs on words and the Bible makes it clear that the word of God is a seed. In Matthew, it says a sower went and he sowed a seed and then he says that the seed is the word of God. The earth runs on seeds. That's why the Bible says whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. It says if you sow to the spirit, you will of the spirit reap eternal life. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. What are you sowing to the flesh? Come on. What are you sowing to the flesh? It is not a physical seed you are putting in the earth. It means actions are seeds. Everything is a seed that we are sowing. A seed goes into your future and leaves a mark in eternity. I'm not making that up. I'm not making it up. When Abraham released Isaac in his heart, it affected eternity. It gave God license as God Almighty to release his own version of Isaac, the son of promise. And if you say, where am I getting that from? Even Galatians tells us that Abraham thought, Galatians 6, that Galatians 4, it says that even Abraham thought he was given Isaac, that Isaac was the son of the promise. Galatians 3.16 says that that seed of the promise was actually not Isaac. Abraham thought it was. He says that seed was Christ. Then he tells us that you are the seed of Abraham in verse 29. A seed goes into your future and it leaves a mark in eternity. The pursuit of money for the sake of earthly possessions is a dangerous place to be. Though God wants us to have these things, it cannot be the core reason 
for our pursuit. It cannot. Amplified version of 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have, have been led astray, some have wandered from the faith, and they have pierced themselves through with many, with many acute mental pangs. Let me read that same verse from the message translation. It says this, 1 Timothy 6 10 message. He says, but if it's only money these leaders are after, or you are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble, and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely, and live to regret it bitterly after, ever after. He says, the pursuit for money, for the sake of just gathering, he says, because of that, many have lost their faith. They've left the church. They've left service in that pursuit. Money itself isn't bad. Notice the scripture didn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. Money itself isn't bad. It, it's when it's our pursuit at all cost. When it controls our decisions and not God. Ah. Now listen, let me push this as I bring it to a close. After Jesus died, did you notice the Pharisees gave money to the centurions to lie about the resurrection of Jesus? They paid the centurions enough money so that they could risk their lives because just them saying that we fell asleep whilst on duty and the disciples came and stole the, 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 uh, the body of Jesus, according to the Roman law, they would have been killed because they were negligent in their duty. But they were paid enough money, listen to me, enough money for them to risk their lives to spread the lies. Pharaoh offered money to, to some argue that Pharaoh actually offered money and income to the midwives so that they will kill the male children so that Moses won't be born. Some people argue that Pharaoh did that. But even if we don't agree with that, King Balak offered Balaam, Balaam, some people say Balaam, Balak, offered lots of money to Balaam so that he will come and he will curse the children of Israel. The Pharisees offered Judas money to betray Jesus. Where am I going with this? The devil has always willingly thrown money at supporting their agenda. It hasn't always been a lot, but it has always been consistent. The devil ensures that he throws money to back his philosophy. The Bible calls the devil the prince and the power of the air in Ephesians. The prince and power of the air. He commands the airwaves. Let's not deceive ourselves. And he spills things regularly on the internet, on television, on radio, things that sway our belief, things that dissuade our faith. You know how you were fine one day with your faith and then you heard something on one of these platforms. You read something on one of these platforms. You watched something and you began to wonder. Jesus said, the people of this world are wiser than those that are of the kingdom. Why? Because amongst other things, what they believe in, they support. What many of us believe in, as it relates to the gospel, we applaud it. We applaud and many a times enjoy the sacrifice of others to bring you the gospel, bring you counsel, bring you effective prayers that have changed your life, bring you encounters with God while we invest elsewhere. We cannot go ye as fast, as fast and as far as we ought without money coming on board. Saints, the Bible speaks of the women that supported Jesus financially. I'm almost done. In Luke 8 from verse 1 to 3 said, Soon afterward, amplified, Jesus went on through towns and villages. Notice, Jesus is moving. Preaching and bringing the good news. Jesus is preaching and bringing the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the 12 apostles were with him. It was an entourage. He says, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been expelled. And then look at this, verse 3. And Joanna, 
the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who ministered to and provided for him and them out of their property and personal belongings. Jesus was going around preaching. Jesus needed the financial support to take the gospel to the towns and the cities. But without their financial support, the journey would have been extremely difficult. Maybe even the journey would have been halted for a period. Let me push. It took Joseph of Arimathea, a man of financial means and societal clout, to get the body of Jesus down from the cross and buried in a new tomb, as was prophesied. It took a man with money. It took a man with societal clout and finances to fulfill divine prophecy. Saints, there are divine prophecies that need to be fulfilled that requires that you and I bring our monies to the table. See this verse, Zechariah 1 verse 17. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My city through prosperity shall be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. He says it requires prosperity for God's kingdom. Did you see that? I'm not making this up. For God's kingdom to be spread abroad. David realized, for example, he couldn't build the temple, so he gave. He gave so much that Solomon needed very little when it was time to build the temple. No wonder David was referred to as a man after God's heart. He didn't just say it. He did what he could to show it. When David had the opportunity to give and was offered for free, he, there was a scenario, and David was being offered property for free. David made a startling statement. Listen to what he said. 2 Samuel 24, 24, you should highlight this in your Bible. And the king said to Arauna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does not cost me something. He said, I will not give something that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. I will give something that cost me something. That was what David was saying. Love the feeling, you know, that feeling, butterflies in your belly. Love the feeling doesn't make the world go round. It's love the action. And love the action costs money. The first thing my pastor said to me when I went to tell him about Pastor Kemi that I had found, you know, a flower in his garden. I wanted to cultivate, you know, it was her pastor uh, that I was interested in her. The first thing he said to me was, are you, um, what's your walk with God like? What's your prayer life? No, the first thing he said is, do you have money? He said, do you have money? I looked at him funny and he said to me, he said, relationships cost money. He wasn't saying I should have a lot of money before I got married. He was saying you better have a plan to have money because you will run a family. You will raise a family. You will have to have money. See, the first thing he said, I know you are in love, but does your love have money? Do you have the resources to back up what you are saying? You cannot say you love someone, but spend money on yourself and on your needs, and I expect the person to agree with you. In our case, actually, we even thank God for the provision, but struggle to give him our tithe and our seed. Many of us started by being great givers, and we saw God do great things. Then either trials or, I don't know, maybe supposed maturity has caused us to change. Paul asked, who has bewitched you? Paul was writing and he said in Romans 10, 14 to 15, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That statement, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach. Whenever you preach the gospel, the Bible says your feet are beautiful. 
He says, in the heavens, your feet are beautiful. Whenever your lifestyle preaches the gospel, your feet are beautiful. Whenever your money is sent to send the gospel, your feet are beautiful. Whenever you do one of the most important, if not the most important part of this, which is you literally go to people and preach the gospel, he says, how beautiful are your feet. I should have titled this whole series, Beautiful Feet. Beautiful Feet. That statement was taken from Isaiah 52. It says, now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for nothing. They that rule over them, make them howl saith the Lord, and my name is continually every day blasphemed. Therefore, my, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. So we see also in Isaiah 6 verse 8, I'll come back to that. It says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. The question is still being asked, Who will go for us? We go with our words. We go with our lifestyles. We go with our money. He says there, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. He says that publisheth peace. He says that publishes peace. He says that publishes salvation. Saints of God, it takes money to publish peace. It takes money to publish salvation. It's free. The gospel itself was actually not free. It cost God everything he had. Everything. In Exodus 36, 5-7, to he says, And they speak unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment that, that and, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work. Did you hear that? Make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing in their offering. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much the people gave. Their hearts were in the things of God, so they gave. They saw a need and they gave. It wasn't that they all had a lot. It wasn't that they all gave the same. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. Because the issue here was not that they all had the same amount to give. Some had more than others. What was, what was relevant was that everybody was willing to give. Do you know they say the average in most churches is that 20% of the entire congregation, no matter how large or how small, that it takes only 20%, it's only 20% of the congregation that supports and fund the entire work. That the rest come, eat, get fat and full, but they do not support with their finances. In Zion, at our last calculation, it looked like it was about 18% of the entire congregation that was financially putting this work on the platforms that is currently blessing you. This has got to change. This has got to change. Some think, some think you have to have a lot to give. Some say, when I have extra, I will give. That's not true and that's not biblical. Jesus spoke about the woman who gave two mites, two mites. Today, maybe you will refer to it as a five cent coin. She gave two mites. And it was all that she had. That wasn't a lot, but it was all she had to give. What? Because giving is a command. The Bible actually says we shouldn't come empty-handed. Do you know it's written in the Bible? That we shouldn't come before the presence of the Lord empty-handed. Meaning our tithe, our giving, our sowing should be budgeted. It should be part of your budget. You must budget it. See this. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2. For in the midst of an ordeal of severe tribulation, their abundance of joy and their depth of poverty together have overflowed in wealth of lavish generosity on their part. I want you to put this on the screen because as I'm reading, some of you might not understand what I'm saying. Put this scripture on the screen. 
it says, it says, you see here that their generosity had nothing to do with their personal abundance. It says they were poor, but they were wealthy in generosity. We go with our words. We go with our lifestyle. We go with our money. Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men, they say today, if you were to um, rebase his wealth, that he would have been worth about 250 billion based on Standard Oil and all the companies that he commanded. He was a believer and a Sunday school teacher. He made a promise to God to fund the church. He started and continued even as a Sunday school teacher, even after he became wealthy. Look at this. He started out by giving what he had um, as he had more, which was, see, what he had then, according to our records, was 50 cents. So he, he started work at, as a 16-year-old and as he got his income, he gave 6% as a 16-year-old. So those of you that are teenagers saying, I don't earn a lot. No, tithing, you start now. You start now. He gave 6% of his income because that's, that's all he felt he could release then. He started by giving 6%. It was only um, 50 cents of his income. Later, he increased it and he kept on increasing and he kept on increasing. We see in scripture, that the, the tithe is 10%, but we will get to that. Let me read what I wrote here. It says, he started out by giving what he had, and as he had more, which then was just 50% a day, about 6% of his income, but he had an agenda. Rockefeller had an agenda. When he was asked how he made his money, he said unequivocally, God gave me this money. And because that, um, and because that was true, he kept on building his giving till he had given, listen to this, hundreds of millions to the then Baptist church and other church-related institutions. All these are online. In all this, he remained a Sunday school teacher. He didn't say he had become too big to serve God. Things were rough for him getting his first job at 16, but he felt he heard God to finance the gospel, and so he did. He started where he was and working with God and working hard. He grew his business to the point that his businesses became monopolies. You don't give because you have a lot. You give because you are commanded by God. You give because you are generous. I'm out of time, but I need to finish this. When Elijah met the widow of Zarephath, today, remember that widow of Zarephath? Today, today, Elijah will be called a charlatan, a thief that takes from the needy. The woman said, all I have is just enough for me and my son, after which we will die. These were Elijah's words in response. Elijah said, bring first for me to eat, then make for your son. So, are you deaf? What kind of man of God are you? What kind? But that, in the natural world, it did not make sense. But God often uses our sacrificial giving, which is an act of trust in him, to break the hold of lack in our lives. There are different types of giving. I will mention them and then I will pray. Number one, they are in no order of importance, they're all important. Number one, your tithe. It's 10% commitment to the Lord. I know some people who haven't tithed because they're saying, do I tithe from the gross? Do I tithe from the net? Just tithe. Stop these stories. When people don't want to give, they begin to go into and they begin to find a nitpick. Just tithe. Just tithe. It's 10% of your commitment to the Lord. And we see in Hebrews 7, 8, it says, here men die, it says, and here men that die receive tithes. This is Hebrews 7, verse 8. Meaning in the time of Hebrews, when it was written, they were still receiving tithes. It says here, men, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. God receives your tithe. He receives it. I'm not, Hebrews 7, verse 8, go read it. Another type of giving is exactly that, your giving. This is your regular weekly giving for the further support of the gospel. Or you could decide that over and beyond your tithe, you make it a monthly thing as well. It is your regular weekly giving. You say weekly? Yes, it's written in scripture. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2. We must open. It's just do what the word says before you complain that it doesn't work. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let, let every one of you lay by him in store, 
as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul said, put it aside. Beginning of every week, put it aside. Today is Sunday, beginning of the week. He says, put it aside. Do, let it be something you thought about, that you thought about. He says, he says in that verse, he says, as God has prospered him, let there be no gatherings when I come. He says, let every one of you lay by him in store. Lay by him in store, meaning it's something you prepared. So your, your regular giving. And then there is giving to projects, meaning your church is doing something, a missionary is going somewhere. You're giving to projects. It's in scripture. We just read it. I won't read it again, but it's in Exodus 36, verse 5 to 7. Actually, it's all over scripture. Uh, they were giving for the building of the, of the tabernacle. They were giving for the building. They gave, see, everybody gave that they had to say, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. Not because everybody had a lot, but everybody was willing to do their part. The body prospers because every part of the body does its part, does its part. That's number three, giving to projects. Number four, sacrificial giving, sacrificial giving. First Kings 17, we just spoke about it, the widow of Zarephath. The widow of Zarephath. Oh, I need to be careful. I bang my finger. So I'm actually in a bit of pain. The widow of Zarephath, that was all she had left. And the prophet said, bring it. Oh, that hurt. Bring it. Bring it. And, 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 and as she gave, it was a sacrifice. And as she gave sacrificially, there was a multiplication. God honors. See, it's not in the money. This is why somebody could give a thousand rand and another person could give a million rand and God regards the thousand rand as the sacrifice and the million rand as just another gift. Why? Because it is not, in the words of, of David, did it cost you something? What makes it a sacrifice? It cost you something. Saints, the Bible speaks about people coming to give to God. And he said, not everybody was joyful. People say, God loves a cheerful giver. When I give that offering, I'm not cheerful. So God can't, it can't be what God desires. Oh no, you're not reading your Bible fully. He loves a cheerful giver. But the Bible also speaking about some of us that give. And he says that there are those, he says that they, are, they come bearing in, in tears, bearing precious seed. Says they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He says they come bearing precious seed. Do you know why that seed was precious? Because it wasn't something they just flipped into their back pocket to bring out. It was a precious seed. He says they that sow in tears, says they will reap in joy. Not in heaven, even on the earth, they will reap in joy. And then I'll give you the last one. No, um, I think there are two more. So their sacrificial giving. Macedonian church was another example. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2 of its sacrificial giving. Number five, giving to orphans and widows. I'll give you two scriptures and then I will move to the last one. In Proverbs 14, 21. He that despiseth his neighbor sins, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. James 1, 27 says, pure religion and undefiled before God. So this is what it is. And the father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Saints, it's not, I know people who say, no, I will give my money to the, to the widows. I'll give my money to the orphans. Check their consistent giving. They are lying to themselves. All these givings I'm explaining to you, we are all supposed to act on them. We are all, this is, uh, that's a lot of money. No, it's not true. It is, it's not every time you give a sacrificial giving. It's not every time that there is a project to give to. It's not every, it's once a month that you give your tithing or depending on how you receive your income and that will change, will change your pattern. Saints, the last one. So it is, it is number one, your tithe. Number two, your regular giving. Number three, giving to projects. Number four, sacrificial giving. Number five, giving to orphans and widows. Number six, giving to your pastor giving to your man of God. Let me give you at least one scripture. Galatians chapter 6 verse 6. He says, Let him who receives instruction in the word of God share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his support. Uh, how many of you understand that that's a bit more than prayer? 
contributing to his support. Let me read to you another one. Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 9, I'll just read some of it. Read it from verse 1 to 12. Very powerful. I'm reading from the Amplified. He says, Am I not an apostle, a special messenger? Am I not free, unrestrained, and exempt from any obligation? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you yourselves not the product and proof of my workmanship in the Lord? Even if I am not considered an apostle, a special messenger by others, at least I am one to you, for you are the seal. Paul was quite upset here. <laughs> for you are the seal, the certificate, the living evidence of my apostleship in the Lord, confirming and authenticating it. This is my real ground of defense, my vindication of myself to those who will put me on trial and cross-examine me. Have we not the right? Have we not the right to our food and drink at the expense of the churches? Listen to what Paul is saying. He says, do we not have rights to eat food and drink drink at the expense of the church? Have we not the right also to take along with us a Christian sister as a wife? Notice it says wife, wife, not wives, as wife, as the other apostles and, and the Lord's brothers and even Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from doing manual labor for a livelihood in order to go about the work of the ministry? Consider this. What soldier at any time serves at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not partake of the milk of the flock? Do I say this only on human authority and as, and as a man reasons? Does not even the law endorse what I am saying? For in the law of Moses it is written, You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the corn. Is it because of an ox God was saying so? Does God care about oxes? This was Deuteronomy 25.4. Or was God not speaking certainly and entirely for our sakes? Assuredly, it is written for our sakes. Because the plowman ought to plow in hope. And the thresher ought to thresh in expectation of partaking of the harvest. If we have sown the seed of spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap from your material benefits? If others share in this rightful claim upon you, do not we have still a better and greater claim? Paul continues. He's saying, come on. If we have blessed you, you should look after us. Saints, do you know for those that have been funding the city of Zion, I bless you. I bless you. And even if I didn't, it doesn't matter. God blesses you. And God will honor you greatly. The works of your hands will prosper. It has to prosper because you have been able to ensure that people have been able to put food on their table. Do you know during this period, even though church has been on lockdown, we have been able, at least as we have agreed with, with those we have on staff, we've been able to pay them in full. Saints of God, yes, some of us have not been able to be paid in full, but at least the staff have been paid in full so that they could live, so that at least the, the, the pinch that almost every home is experiencing, the pinch they will not experience. Saints, Paul, what Paul was saying, he was complaining, he said, is it wrong? I am supposed to eat from what comes from there. God writes it that I should. And yet when, when pastors do that, people go crazy. I see, I see people making comments when they see pastors going on holiday. It is wicked. Do you know it is wicked? You, will, you, you receive from what they teach. It bless, if you are not being blessed, come on. Then, I mean, you are under no obligation. You are getting blessed. It is okay for you to go on a holiday. It is okay for you to take you and your family for a week, two weeks, wherever post your pictures but when a pastor does the same the the world is on fire saints of God what people think is not our issue what does the word say the gospel will be limited if we don't all come on board to back it up financially you are required start from where you are start from where you are <sighs> and work your way through. Give your tithe, give your offerings, give your, your, your what's it called, your special sacrificial seeds. Listen to the voice of God and respond. 
let the gospel go out. You know, right now we are, I don't know for how long we'll be on TBN, but we're on TBN. The message you hear, don't you think the world needs to hear it? Right now, that message is so brief. My mother called me all the way from Nigeria and she says, uh, she called my dad to say, your son is on, your son is on. Watch now, you know he's only on for about less than 10 minutes. So watch now. And it hit me. What we share, we need more than 10 minutes to do it. Your businesses will prosper, but so will your heart of generosity. Proof, proof that you are generous is not when you have a lot, is now, is now. We go ye with our words. We go ye with our lifestyle. Your life must show it. We go ye with our money. My prayer is that you will go forth with your money. Send the gospel where you cannot go. Ah, I'm done. If you are watching for the first time and you are not born again, it's simple. You just need to repeat this prayer after me. Ah, saints, it says, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. He's knocking. Open your heart now. Open your heart. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that is you, or maybe you're born again and you're saying, I've not walked the right path. I hear you. We all were there at some point. It's time. You can walk the path now. Repeat after me. Dear God, I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and I believe with my heart that you raised him from the dead. Therefore, from this moment, I am born again. Thank you, Father, for accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, A. Amen and amen. This is one of those messages you need to hear again. Actually, you need to hear the whole series over and over again because we need to save the lost. We are not done. Please don't walk out yet. We have a few announcements uh, coming up and then I'm going to come back and we will share the benediction. Please receive with me, Pastor Jerry, for the announcements. God bless you. We thank you for joining us for today's online service. Now here's two important questions you must ask yourself. What did the message say to me? And what, if any, is my response? Join us again for our Sunday morning online service with Pastor Tim Grage on YouTube next week Sunday at 10 a.m. For your tithes and offering, here are our banking details. Please note that your heartfelt giving to the Kingdom in this season will aid the many struggling financially in this time and we thank you for your generosity. Thank you so much Pastor Tim. Uh, you know it's so wonderful to serve in a house of givers and this morning my only job is to pray over the offering that I know that you are getting ready. Um, it is the beginning of the month and so I know that you're getting your tithe ready. The information for the City of Zion, our banking information should be on your screen right now. Now if you'd like to become a Sunday School teacher with us here at the City of Zion, we are offering training on the 22nd of March. It's a busy, busy month for us here. So uh, do let us know at info at coz.org if you would like to become a Sunday school teacher with us because it's getting really busy. Um, Pastor Tim will probably share this with you, but we have devotionals starting with us on this coming Monday um, on YouTube with him at 5 a.m. Very, very exciting, Velvet and Steel, our women's ministry at the City of Zion is having their first event of the year on the 27th of the month. So please, 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 if you have not registered with the City of Zion, you want to do so as soon as possible. We are really a group of praying women, but we're also a group of fellowshipping women. Uh, we love getting together. So uh, as soon as you find out about it, 
if there are details on the posters and advertisements that you get on, let us know if you'd like to join us. It's going to be exciting. Uh, also, what you want to get a hold of is any information about our City Life groups. Those are um, sort of our home cells that we have within the City of Zion. It's an opportunity for us to get together in small groups within the, the church. It's sort of what we call our families within the family. It's where we break down the Word of God and really begin to understand what it is that Pastor Tim shares with us on a Sunday. We used to be able to share within our homes around the city, but now we're sharing them on Zoom and on WhatsApp, which is so beneficial for those of us who, for example, now online don't live within Johannesburg. So we now can include all of you who have gotten to know us in this medium of our online church. So please do let those of us who are online know where you are and whether you would like to become a part of our online City Life groups and become part of our intimate family ministry during the week. Then on the 26th of March, we're having a new members welcoming session where those of you who have not been introduced to all of our pastors can really have an intimate session with us. We're looking forward to meeting you all. Welcome back. Let's do the benediction together. But before I go there, let me just again reiterate. Remember, um, Sunday school, 10.30. 10.30. It's up. It's already there. If you are not in live services with us, get your kids to watch it. I've said this once. I'll keep saying it. If you will engage them now with God's word like we are trying to put out there for you, they will give you less help in years to come. So make sure, get them to watch Sunday School. All things being equal, devotionals will start from tomorrow. You don't want to miss it, 5 a.m. squad, or you can watch it at any time you desire. Hope you were blessed. If it blessed you, like, share, put it out there, and let's get to sending the word out there. This week, will you begin your own record? Let's begin to send each other names and say, I just got this person saved and, and Shaniqua is saved and, 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 and that person is saved and Shalane is saved. And let's do the work of the ministry. It's why you are still alive. God bless you. Whatever area of your life is troubled and traumatized, I speak the hand of God over your life. I stand in agreement with you. Sick in the body, be healed. Broken in your heart, be restored. Seeking a job, I speak intervention. Barrenness, let your womb receive seed. Cultivated to full term. Troubled in mind, peace. Troubled in your marriage, wisdom, peace. I speak to you right now. The help of God finds you. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Let's share the grace together. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, abide with us now, forevermore. And surely, because goodness, His mercies are following us all the days of our lives. And we are the dwelling house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. If you can, I hope to catch you live in service next week Sunday. Bye for now. Welcome to the city of Zion. Welcome to the city on a hill. This is home. This is our family. This is where we connect. This is where we come alive. It's where we worship. It's where we grow. This is where we encounter God. Where no one is a stranger. And where no one is alone. This is where we find purpose. Where you are loved. And it's where we serve. This is where we learn. And it's where change begins. This is where people matter and hope is real. 
This is where God is glorified. Where God transforms. We are God's people. We are the city of Zion.